Welcome once again to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We are in the second module of our series of lectures in the course entitled English Language and Literature. This module as th those of, for those of you who have been following these in a chronological manner, you are aware that this module is uh, exclusively on the history of English language of the English language. We have already discussed uh, the general features or uh, you know the overview in the first lecture on um, which was entitled introduction to the history of the English language. And uh, we have been through um, old English and middle English. Today the lecture is on early modern English, which is lecture 4 in the second module. And before we move on to the top topic proper, let us as, as usual take a brief look on what we did in the last lecture, what we talked about in the last lecture by way of a recap. Now, I cannot uh, um, reiterate this enough that really these lectures, the lectures in our course are uh, may not be English 101 in the sense that they are topics are quite vast, but these are these lectures are I would say elementary you know in their level and by more like an introduction to each of these lectures is an introduction to the topic declared uh, in each of these. And for those of you who are not in engineering colleges or the students of which are the target okay, audience for these lectures uh, may want to view these lectures, learn from these or in uh, simply by way of recapitulating what you had learnt in your say BA English major etcetera. Uh, these are by uh, these lectures are by no means high level ones. Okay. So, uh, I would like the audience to appreciate the level in which we are talking. It may be an elementary level, but these are always at least to my experience as a student and teacher always relevant and things that we need to visit uh, time and again. Okay. So, we found in our last lecture on uh, middle English that the middle English period was one of great change and we had taken recourse to uh, books like A. C. Ball's History of the English Language and uh, several other uh, texts, which as I, as I said um, have mentioned also in some other lectures. Uh, these lectures are these books are class are regarded classics, okay. They are books that one can go back always, right, to know about the the established at least the established features okay, of English at any given time. Okay, in the past. Right? So, in one of these books we find that the middle English period was a period of great change okay? and we know that the Norman conquest okay, you, you must realize this that the lectures that we many of the lectures that we give here and it ideally it should be so okay, are always related to political um, maybe upheavals or general political changes, the changes of power from one hand to the uh, to another, uh, s social factors, technological factors like say the industrial revolution about which we will be talking a lot in the next lecture on modern English. Okay. So, here too we find that the Norman conquest and the Norman conquest and the conditions that followed were responsible for a period of great change. And yet we also find continuations of tendencies that had begun to manifest themselves in old English. Okay. See the division of uh, periods or epochs or not really exactly epoch eras, okay, ages in history and uh, as you will know um, does not uh, imply you know watertight boundaries, right? does not imply that one age moves into the next and that there are no remnants from the previous age okay, or there or, or that there are no glimmerings of what is to come. In the same way okay, though we had major changes following the coming of the Norman French, the conquest by the Norman French, 
about which we talked at great length in the last lecture. Okay, there were also in the middle ages uh, sorry in middle English uh, the continuation of certain tendencies okay, following the coming in of Anglo Saxons okay, the, uh, and the beginning of the Anglo Saxon language. Now, next we also found importantly that the last phase that is middle English marked the decay of inflectional endings. Okay. The grammar as mentioned here in one of the texts, the grammar of the English language was reduced from a highly inflected language to an analytical one. Now, the endings of these nouns, adjectives okay, and to some extent verbs were altered in pronunciation in a way that lost almost lost their distinctive form. Right? Now, we also found that uh, borrowing from the vocabulary of the French, okay, the the sheer importance given to French culture, the need of the people to cultivate right, French culture, not just its uh, manners or mannerisms or fashions etcetera is also what was important also was, was in the middle ages uh, sorry again I am so sorry in, in middle English okay, was the borrowing of words okay, from French. For instance, we found that there were governmental and administrative words like government itself governor, administrator, then crown, princess, okay, uh, things in, uh, 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 indicating class for instance, servant, right, peasant, slave, noble, uh, etcetera. Also very important were ecclesiastical words, okay, ecclesiastical words like religion, theology, sermon, mystery, devotion, miracle, hermit, these are some of the words we find which uh, came in and became part and parcel of the English language following the Norman conquest in the time of what we call now call middle English. Then uh, law and the army and navy these were also there were also the uh, sort of in, in inclusion of words from these um, uh, domains for instance a uh, decree okay, from law decree proof bail then punishment, prison, right? these are some of the words that have come in justice itself, the word justice, the word crime itself. Fine. Then from the army and navy, the words army, navy, peace, lieutenant or lieutenant, enemy, dart, sergeant, chieftain, havoc etcetera, these were the words that came and enriched the English language. For also from fashion, fashion and meals and, and social life, cultural life in general, these are some of the words which I have taken from various sources. These include fashion, dress, habit, gown, coat and for um, food, beef, mutton, sausage, gravy, biscuit, cream, sugar etcetera. So, these the words which we think uh, you know which uh, to us are English words, it is to be remembered are words that have come from various languages and particularly when we talk about middle English, okay, the Norman conquest was as I said a landmark, right, it was a landmark uh, event in or series of events in, uh, in during that time which had enormous repercussions for further growth and change of the English language. Then uh, not the least in art, learning and medicine also we find words like chronicle, the very word paper, pen, okay, copy, then malady, right, plague, remedy from the, from the domain of uh, um, uh, from medicine and you know uh, the medical sciences, poison, arsenic, right, these are some of the words that have come in. Then we also found very important point which is the rise of standard English. Okay. And let me, let me quickly again read, this is available in the last lecture, but let us just quickly go through it again. By the end of the 14th century, a language emerged in the written form that varied with the local dialects. This was recognized as the standard language both in English and writing and was called London English. It is very important. Okay. The rise for the first time really, even though there may have been uh, you know, um, of sporadic, um, uh, you know, emergence of a dialect that was going to become more or less a standardized or standard dialect. It is in this time that we find the rise of standard English. Okay, so by the end of the 14th century, which was known as London English, or it was the 
um, dialect of of uh, of East Midland. Midland okay. So, that was a clear indication of and uh, you know of the emergence of a standard or standardized English okay, which is London or East Midland di dialect. And also the, the this reason region was also a vastly populated one, it was also a large one and in terms of trade etcetera in, or in terms of general prosperity this region was also okay, uh, so, sort of this was this, re, this region was uh, the sort of hub right and perhaps for for that reason as many scholars would insist okay this uh, uh, this um, this east midland dialect or the london english became the standardized english or standard english now we also found that the the found that the, uh, uh, you know that much has been said about the importance of london english okay and uh, and let me then read again from Bohr. By far the most influential factor in the rise of standard English was the importance of London as the capital of England. London English took as well as gave. It began as a southern and ended as a Midland dialect. And the London standard had been accepted in most parts of the country in writing in the latter part of the 15th century. Okay? So, this is uh, finally how it came to be established by the 15th century. Now, uh, we come to early modern English and we do not really speak of just a modern English. Okay? We usually divide the history of the English language at this time okay, into two distinct categories. These are early modern English and modern English or late modern English. Okay? Modern English, late modern English is usually referred to as modern English, which is a topic of our of discussion in our next lecture. Okay. So, again you may look at several texts, but for our purposes, Bohr's again a history of the English language and Indrani Ghosh uh, history of the English language, a critical companion. These are some of the books that I have consulted for this lecture and also um, uh, in a minor way some other books. So, in general as I said modern English what I said in the last just a couple of minutes uh, uh, seconds ago the uh, in general if you say modern English you would start from say 15 from the 16th century that is 1500 okay? and in particular the renaissance which is 1500 to 1650 is a time that is enormously important for us as far as it's early, uh, early uh, modern English is concerned. Right? Now, scholars list the changing conditions in the modern period and let us look at it this slowly and carefully. Right? Now, again according to Bohr, there are particular events in the development of languages which have often been have recognizable effects like the Norman conquest and the black death or the, or the bubonic plague. Okay? Now, the new factors which are there in the development of modern English right, were four the general the macro ones were four there were several others but for our purposes it is enough for us to know that there were four very important uh, socio economic conditions under which modern english developed particularly early modern english okay so these are the coming of the printing press okay the bringing in on in of the printing press by william caxton in england and also second the rapid spread as it were of of uh, popular education in England. Then also the increased means of social communication. Okay? The, uh, then finally, the growth of social consciousness with uh, a the rapid growth okay, of, of uh, reading following the printing press and thereafter the rapid growth of social communication. Do you understand? So, what are the first four points that we have? This is rap the, the coming in of the printing press. Number two is the rapid spread of so of uh, popular education, the increased communication and increased social communication, and the growth of social consciousness. Now, let us take an example, uh, a very brief extract from A. C. Ball's uh, book, and then we will have an idea of where what things were, conditions were at that time. Now, from A. C. Ball's History of the English Language. The majority of these, it is true, were in Latin, whereas it is in the modern languages that the effect of the printing press was chiefly to be felt. But in England, over 20,000 titles in English had appeared by 1640. The result was to bring books 
which had formerly been look at this the expensive luxury of the few. Okay. Things no longer stopped at this, okay. books were no longer the, uh, the things of luxury that were available only to the rich or only to the poor or only in you know uh, manuscript form in, in abbeys or churches or you know in other, other libraries. Right? As Bob says the result was to bring books which had formerly been the expensive luxury of the few within the reach of all. Okay. We were talking about in the, in the previous slide which relates to the rapid spread of popular education with the coming in of the printing press. Then it was possible to reproduce a book in a thousand copies or even a hundred thousand every one exactly like the other. And he says he comments here a powerful force thus existed for promoting a standard uniform language. Okay. You see how when you are talking about this we can talk about this over and over again okay how the impact how technology has an impact okay ultimately on social consciousness right we had the coming in of the printing press in england we had the availability okay as he says here uh, maybe 1000 or maybe even 100000 copies of books which were you know available or accessible to a very you know uh, 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 to a very small part of the population. Once you had a hundred thousand or more copies of one one text, okay, what happened was many people <laughs> it is not even now it is it, at this time it is not that everyone has a copy of the book, okay, but maybe through lending library growth of lending libraries or even through personal contact you were able you by that by this time okay, to be able to read books which were not accessible to you. So, therefore, we had the growth of popular education also reading possessing books must have also also become a matter uh, a matter of pride to be able to have you know a collection of books. Okay. So, as he says a powerful force he call, Bohr calls it a powerful force, the printing press was a powerful force, okay. a powerful force thus existed and along with this of course, also was a standard uniform language. Now, why is it important? Because you had whatever the printing uh, press was providing to you was English of a certain kind, of a certain standard, of a certain dialect. Okay. Now, when you had more people who are reading these books okay, with the spread of popular education or even of the, you know uh, uh, the enlarging of the or the growing sorry the growth of the um, the growth of the reading public okay what happened was it led to them also speaking a certain standard or a certain dialect if you will of a variety of english so this again led to what we found was a very important point the first point in our lecture here was that the rise of a standard english and that which was of the of the which is the, the, the Midland dialect East Midland dialect uh, or what we call the, the London uh, what we call London English. So, there was then the rapid spread of popular education literacy was becoming common in Shakespeare's London almost more than half of the people could read. In the 17th and 18th centuries there was an increase in the number of schools and the tradesman class arose who for whom obtaining an uh, education also was immensely important. Okay, so, what we have by now we have found that compared definitely compared to the middle ages not to talk about uh, um, middle English not to talk about old English um, by the uh, uh, compared to old and middle English Englishes what happened was and during this time okay, there was literacy was something that was common and to and was increasingly being expected of people right. And many could many many people could read by the time of Shakespeare's England okay, by, the, by the 16th 17th centuries. And in the, it says in the in uh, the 17th and 18th centuries there was an increase also in the number of schools okay. and you had the rise of the mercantile class the rise of the tradesman class for whom uh, being literate was very important for whom even an edu, you know, getting an education was very important. So, the radical you know the radical forces in matters of vocabulary and in matters of grammar and, and conservative forces in matters of grammar. Okay. 
So, at during this stage when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, grammar and vocabulary, there are two tendencies that we see. Okay. With regard to vocabulary, it appears now that the forces of change were radical, while as far as grammar is concerned was concerned the, the forces were conservative ones. Right? Though in the middle ages, uh, middle English period changes in grammar were considered revolutionary, okay? whereas changes in vocabulary were not. It was seen that seemed as if it was quite the opposite when we come down to this age. Then we also had what we call was the uh, what Bohr calls the problem of the vernaculars. Okay? The three great problems faced by modern languages in the 16th century were these a recognition in the fields where Latin had for centuries being supreme, okay? the establishment of a more uniform orthography and the enrichment of the book vocabulary, so that it would be adequate to meet the demands that would be made upon it in its wider use. Okay? So, this was the time when compared to Latin, there were other languages. Do you understand? There, the, there were languages that gen generally speaking okay, in Europe, there are languages that that were coming up for recognition, otherwise in which the classical languages had held sway. As Bohr says in, you know, in, in his book, beside the classical languages which seemingly had attained perfection, the vulgar terms seemed immature, unpolished and limited in resource. Right? There was still there was this attraction towards, towards ancient learning, towards Latin and Greek and therefore, we also f find that vernaculars Okay. Languages like English were in a struggle so to speak for recognition. Right? You have all heard of the revival of learning which we call the renaissance. Uh, it was a revival of interest, great interest not only in the languages, but also in the cultures, also in the art, also in on the philosophy, great interest in the philosophy of ancient Greece and Rome. Okay. So, Greek and Latin were uh, languages just just like in you know in the, in, in, in the middle uh, English period okay it was uh, sort of it was considered to be uh, to be a matter of pride you know to know French right to know Fr French manners to be well versed in in the French language okay in French art cuisine etc right so also we will find by the Renaissance, a knowledge or at least an interest in things classical okay, was, was something that was considered desirable okay, if one were to make one's mark among scholars, among poets, even among scientists. The a knowledge of the classics was considered very, very desirable. Okay. So, therefore, there was the renewed interest uh, in Latin and Greek and as Bohr says besides these you know uh, so called polished ancient languages okay, lang languages with a great history behind them okay, which languages that seem to have attained almost you know a stage of perfection other languages uh, the what we call the vulgar terms uh, vulgar sorry uh, vulgar tongues sorry tongues seemed rather immature and unpolished and, and limited in their resources. This is what again again Bohr says okay, uh, how then do we account for English right and I am bringing in this passage here from Bohr and let us see how he explains this. Okay. Please look at this slide. Bohr says the real force behind the use of English let us underline this was a popular demand the demand of all so look at this is very important all sorts of men in practical life look at these words popular practical all sorts of men okay let's read this again the real force behind the use of english was a popular demand the demand of all sorts of men in practical life to share in the fruits of the renaissance the revival of learning had revealed how rich was the store of knowledge and experience preserved from the civilizations of greece and rome the ancients had not only lived but had thought about life and drawn practical conclusions from, uh, from experience. Much was to be learned from their discussion of conduct and ethics, their ideas of government and the state, their political precepts, their theories of education, their knowledge of military science 
and the like. Okay. So, it was considered that if you knew if you knew uh, the English language right, you could have access to the great ideas of you know uh, of the um, of the ancients through uh, of, of Latin and Greek okay, especially through translations. So, the revival of learning as Bohr says had revealed how rich was the store of knowledge and experience preserved from the civilizations of Greek and Rome. So, you see there you had Anglo Saxon English and then you had the French the Norman French conquest right, where there, there was this historic tussle between the French language and the English language. Okay. Here we had a language that had, that had begun to you know uh, that had begun to uh, sort of uh, uh, have its first almost official standardized version in London English thanks to the rise again of London as the center okay, of England. And on the other hand you also had a sort of you say a, you know I would not use the word pressure, but also there is also this great temptation to go into things that were classical and to learn classical the classical languages. Do you understand? So, you would find the English language time and again sort of um, you know the, the uh, it is Anglo Saxon English, English okay, sort of always facing you know these forces of other languages from other places. We then the, uh, the question arises okay, of enrichment. Now, the, when, when we allow okay, this may this question may ri uh, uh, um, rise with uh, arise anywhere with any language for instance, uh, is it a matter of enrichment when we allow I should not use the word allow really, but when, when, when we take words or we have foreign loan words, we take words from other languages okay, and they become part of us. So, we scholars call this the problem of enrichment and the problem is of one of enlarging the vocabulary. Okay. So, what might happen is if you borrow too much okay, from Latin and Greek or from French or you know if you if your neologisms or new words okay, are etymologically heavily leaning on these languages, okay, then the Anglo Saxon or the, the English that you are talking about may be viewed by people as by some as inadequate especially as compared to classical languages. You are coining new words okay, based on uh, antiquity, okay. uh, you already have uh, words from another, um, another country. Okay which had come and, and uh, conquered you right. And you had not only that you also had borrowings from say Italian and Spanish etcetera. Okay. So, is this a matter of enlarging is a simple simply enlarging the vocabulary okay, or is it a problem of enrichment through others. Now, this is something that we leave to um, the linguists and the people of uh, you know philology and the people in the history of languages uh, to decide and debate just suffice it here to just bring it to your notice that whatever was seen as inclusion and enlargement of vocabulary and, a, and, and the growth of vocabulary may also be seen as a problem of sort of downplaying okay downplaying uh, your the the sort of vernacular if you may use the word here when, when you allow a lot of what is quote unquote foreign influence okay, to come in to the existing language. Let us quickly look at this slide on this for and against the borrowing of words like Bohr again here, here um, he, he makes this observation. Okay. He says the wholesale borrowing of words look at these look at this language the wholesale borrowing of words from other languages did not did not meet with universal favor. Okay. So, it is not that everyone was happy that you know words have been brought uh, or imported so to speak from other languages. This you know the strangeness of the new words was an objection to some people. Now, it is not that the word is new. Okay. If it comes from another language the intonation is new, okay. the pronunciation is new, the cultural resonances that words carry these are felt to be alien by many people. 
you know this is idea that this word is not exactly home grown ok. So, it has several various even political resonances as it comes into uh, one's vernacular la language ok. So, let us read this again the wholesale borrowing of words from other languages did not meet with universal favor. The strangeness of the new words was an objection to some people. Now, however, there were more uh, you know scholarly people who looked at this phenomenon okay, of borrowing words from uh, other languages in a more balanced manner. And John Dryden for instance, uh, many of you may have heard of uh, you know the great poet John Dryden. Dryden uh, was of the opinion okay, that as long as you know the importations was as Boss says judicious, as long as these were judicious importations one should not really have much to complain as far as borrowing words uh, was concerned. Okay. So, uh, it was a, a matter of balancing you know the coming in of uh, new words as against the existing tendency or existing pool of words that were there since the Anglo Saxon times or even, be, even before these times. So, some you know there are few borrowed words here for instance that we may refer to and uh, from Greek for instance the words that were borrowed were encyclopedia, acme, anonymous, criterion, ephemeral, lexicon, polemic, tantalize, tonic, thermometer. Then the let us look at again what Bohr says about the method of introducing these new words. Okay. Now, the Latin words usually were from the medium of writing. The words borrowed from the romance languages often entered through books and uh, Bohr here mentions and I will look uh, quickly read this quotation. What uh, writers like say Thomas More and Thomas Eliot were doing was being done by numerous others and it is necessary to recognize the importance of individuals as makers of English in the 16th and early 17th century. Okay. These are what we get through their works or through as it says the medium of writing. By 1721 uh, we find this is 150 years later after Mulcaster had urged for the compilation of a dictionary in 1582. The first dictionary was published by Nathaniel Barley called Universal Etymological English Dictionary. Okay. The earliest dictionaries explain the meanings of the words in Latin or other foreign languages and hard words in English. Okay. So, we had these early dictionaries would go you know to, to great lengths okay, to explain the meanings of the words which were which came from Latin or other languages or, or even words that were in English, but were considered difficult. Now, let us look at some of uh, the important dictionaries that are listed here in uh, the 17th century mostly. These are Robert Cordray's the, alpha, the table alphabetical of hard words, John Bullocker's English expositor 1616, the first is 1604, Henry Cockerham's English dictionary 1616, Edward Phillips's New World of Words 1658. <laughs> Glossographia by Blount 1656 and Dr. Samuel Johnson's famous a dictionary of the English language in 1755. We also find the influence the great influence of a writer like Shakespeare as far as the vocabulary is concerned. Okay. Say Shakespeare <coughs> sorry invented uh, over 1700 words some of these are mentioned here for instance cold blooded, bee smirch, bandit, luggage, majestic, moonbeam, negotiate. There are so many words and, and that uh, you know we do not realize have come to us from Shakespeare. For instance, the word like hobnob, marketable. Okay, the word marketable you may think is more of you know of a modern uh, more uh, you know or, or, or later uh, word you know uh, than than uh, and we would not expect that to come from Shakespeare's time probably, but these are some of the words that Shakespeare had given us zany, worthless, secure, skim, milk etcetera. Uh, there were further also many expressions that we get from Shakespeare, okay? um, very innovative ones that uh, have become part of early modern English. Okay? Cold comfort, hmm? cold comfort is such a phrase, 
then clear out bag and baggage the without rhyme or reason then uh, goodness sake or by Jove okay, that truth will out vanish into thin air. These are some of the expressions that phrases that we owe to Shakespeare. As far as grammatical features were concerned this is what Bohr has to say I am quoting from Bohr English grammar in the 16th and 17th century is marked more by the survival of certain forms and usages that have since disappeared than by any fundamental developments. Okay. The great changes which reduced the inflections of old English to their modern proportions had already taken place and we remember we in our last lecture on mi in mi middle English this was these inflectional the changes regarding inflections may what uh, 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 you know were highlighted there. Okay. Now, Bohr says that uh, as far as grammar is concerned okay, in the early modern uh, beginning with the early modern um, uh, phase of English what we find that it uh, says here is marked more by survival of certain forms and usages okay, uh, that have disappeared than, than any really great fundamental change that came in. And already said the, the you could say the pruning of the language uh, the pruning of the inflections of inflectional endings had already happened before this. Okay. So, if we uh, have to end with the gen general characteristics of this period there would be four points from Bo again that you know uh, we need to learn right. We find that a there was a conscious interest of the people in the English language. Okay. This is important a conscious interest of the people in the English language that is there was a new attitude towards the language and an attention to its problems so that could be seen during this time. Okay. So, we have a conscious interest of the people in the English language a new attitude towards the language and an attention to its problems all you would say in a bid. Uh, to this new the emerging London English diet, uh, 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 dialect as a standard uh, the standard uh, dialect or standard language during that time. Okay. Then importantly the second point in this period something in the nature of a standard and not just standard a recognizably modern form of the language was attained scholars say at, at this time. Okay. So, there was not only just a standard language you can have a standard language in any time any any dialect can be a standard dialect okay, in any time in the history of any language. Okay. The important thing was the fact that the language had a modern form to it thanks mostly to the final ending of a final ending of inflectional endings which had begun in the middle English period. English in the renaissance was much more plastic plastic by here plastic we mean far more amenable to change okay, far more um, for instance we use the word plasticity uh, when we talk about neural plasticity. Okay. So, the uh, I will say the quality of its, uh, its quality of adaptability okay, uh, to adapt it, uh, itself to change because of its flexibility. Okay. So, English in the renaissance as Bohr says was much more plastic than today as men felt freer to mold it according to their wills. Okay. It is interesting it is not that you may think instinctively or it may uh, you know you may think it is sort of in a quote unquote commonsensical way that things become more plastic or more flexible. Uh, with time is not so. In the next lecture when you look at American English you will find uh, that there is some in very interestingly some tendencies to freeze the language that they brought from England to the new world. Whereas, in England those were already changing. Okay. So, it does not mean that just because one has gone to uh, into a new land or just with the passage of time that language freezing will go up it is not so simple a phenomenon. Okay. So, language English language was far, far more plastic far more flexible adaptable it was taking in it had always and was still taking in new words okay, from other languages to, the, to an extent of course, where it became uh, problematic right. It, it became a question of uh, you know national nationalistic uh, interest whether one should allow so many languages to 
uh, be added uh, so many words sorry from so many languages to be added to the, uh, the mother tongue right. So, there many features were still unsettled though uh, with regard to spelling and pronunciation as because of this sort of uh, tendency where things were not things were already all uh, things were quite fluid that there was the stand, there was a standard at the same time there was a standard dialect at the same time there were other probably um, other standards probably that were clamoring uh, you know for inclusion into the rising uh, uh, London English and the, these features like pronunciation for instance were um, not what we find today in you know the official sort of Queen's English as we say. Okay. So, spelling and pronunciation was still fluid and people were still experimenting uh, different um, you could say different parts of um, uh, of England were probably people in different parts of England were probably also showcasing their pronunciations and their spelling. So, the time uh, by it is only by the modern age okay, that you find um, that the, the establishment of a greater stability. Okay. Even though of course, in, in modern English you all have we also have the important variations that we find in um, uh, beginning with uh, uh, the new world with America and uh, be, uh, with uh, places like India, places like Australia etcetera. Okay. So, um, we have come to the end of this, uh, this introductory glimpse into early modern English and um, uh, instead of doing a uh, you know recap of what we have learned, let me pose questions to you and give you an exa uh, uh, example of how you, you may want to attempt those questions. Okay. For instance, one the first question may be something like what were the four most important changing conditions okay, in uh, modern English, uh, particularly early modern English, okay, which differentiate it um, in a radical way from the previous periods in the history of the English language. Okay. So, these are you would say that there are four factors okay, which led to the growth of early modern and eventually modern English. Uh, and we also say that you know we, we do not take modern English as from, uh, from as, as one homogeneous uh, age, we break it okay, from the renaissance onwards and we break it into early modern English and late modern or modern English. So, the, the four factors were A very importantly the bringing in of the uh, printing press by Caxton okay, to England and following that what happened was the were the others the next three that is A the rapid spread of popular education okay, with the availability of books. Then there is increased communication and increased social communication. Okay. Playhouses right, played very important you did not have the modern pubs that you did. Okay. The playhouses were the most important probably uh, uh, av, uh, you know um, avenues and arenas of, of social communication the people. Okay. Then Finally, the growth of social consciousness, the growth of social consciousness with uh, you know the playhouses and next the availability of texts, okay. the availability of what we today call hard text right, uh, because of the coming in of the printing press that was question number 1. Now, if you can get a question like this according to the scholar A. C. Baugh a powerful force existed for promoting a standard uniform language explain. Okay. Now, we have to explain what this powerful force was right. So, you would then say again that this powerful force was that of the printing press and you can also say that in um, the it resulted okay, in this important cultural phenomenon that was the availability of texts which were hitherto what which were hitherto um, items of luxury okay, or items of access and privileges, privilege. Okay. The, with the availability of hundreds of thousands of copies of a single text right, 
uh, they were bound to be enormous social changes which also led to the change or uh, you know or to the growth and development of the language more people were using it the second important point regarding this powerful force was that it had to lead to a standardized english why because people hitherto were different were very different you may find people just within a few kilometers being different as far as the usage as far as their pronunciation was concerned as far as the spelling was concerned particularly with spelling okay with, with particularly with things like turns of phrase right when they are available to you in in the forms of text and that uh, that is a text that is being read by everyone it eventually obviously would lead to a certain standardized form of the language so th a sort of you know this marks the end of a sort of uh, a certain if I may use the word it is a certain chaotic uh, element as far as the English language was concerned. Okay. So, we have the rise of standardized English okay, which was we will talk about it next the next that would be the next question. Okay. Another question would be um, what were the other other uh, changes okay, in, 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 in society for instance and you would say one very important change was the availability or the you know uh, the establishment uh, an increase in the establishment of a number of schools a okay now again with schools what happens is you get standardized uh, standardized versions of a language okay everyone in that in a school and nearby schools were learning the same kind probably from the same text okay so there has to be a standardization and also there was a rise again second point the rise of a certain class which was the tradesman class or the mercantile class for whom education was very important. Okay. Next what was the, the you know what is the two phase or two sided aspect to the question of the vernaculars okay, vis a vis the so called prestige languages like the languages of antiquity like uh, uh, Latin and Greek and language of prestige which was there in the last uh, period middle ages uh, middle I am so sorry middle English uh, which was uh, French. Okay. So, uh, there are two we may, we may talk about two things one is of course that there is the uh, there is a need with the revival of learning with the renaissance okay, to also know Latin and Greek. Okay, just as in the previous age French was, was so important for many people to know and learn French. Okay. Uh, more so because by you know as Bo says um, when you placed the so called vernacular alongside the Greek and the Latin then the vernacular tongues would then seem what we call vulgar tongue the tongue of the you know the, the common common man's language okay seemed immature as Bo says unlimited uh, sorry limited and unpolished so this was one part of the problem okay then the other uh, aspect to it was again all sorts of people all sorts of says uh, says all sorts of men which mean probably means people from all classes okay to put it in another way of all classes okay wanted access to the ideas of the ancients okay as far as practical life was concerned as far as philosophy was concerned right but again the the other side of the other side of the picture is this that people wanted uh, the other side side of the story was that that people were worried okay with what they found as many are worried as uh, you know with what they read as a random inclusion of lang of words from other languages Okay. There is a question also the rise of the nationalistic fervor which we see since the time of uh, Geoffrey Chaucer. Okay. Uh, there was uh, the rise of the nationalistic spirit and too much deviation from Anglo Saxon right? or too many borrowings that this is, this is more correct too many borrowings from other languages were even to be seen as anti nationalistic. Okay. Uh, on the, we also had scholars as I said like John Dryden uh, who said that judicious importations as reported by A. C. Bo, judicious importations from other languages was fine and one had to know 
when a, a, a word was to be considered how of course, one uh, word was to be con, uh, considered judicious. Then uh, therefore, the next question would be what is the uh, you know what do you refer what is referred to as a problem of enrichment this is the, the it is a similar uh, you know answer really is it was it considered a matter of enrichment or was it considered a matter of dependence. Okay. So, was it enriching the vocabulary were they enriching the vocabulary by allowing other words to come in or were they being dependent too much on other tongues. Then you could also um, uh, get a question on, on the, the importance of dictionaries for instance why were dictionaries so important at this time. Okay. Dictionaries were important at this time for two reasons and say that one reason one was of course, because of the you know the sheer growth right of the lexicon okay uh, they because of the of the printing press and the growth of pub, uh, of publishing right because of that there was a need to have dictionary so that uh, you know it, words that were being now available see the kind the number and the kind of words that were now being available to people uh, that this was a force that was not there before, right? Uh, how much can you? How many new words can you know only through social conversation, or only through hearsay? Here you had books which had so many words that many people could not understand. Okay, so the rise or this is the time of the dictionary, right? The first dictionaries, and second was important also to unpack the meaning of words that were even in English that were considered hard. Okay. For instance, as we, we saw here the earliest dictionaries explained the meanings of the words in Latin or other foreign languages and so, so called hard words in English. So, the growth of the dictionary was uh, it was inevitable that during this time there would be numerous dictionaries that were coming out okay, and finally, culminating in the one great dictionary of those times of the 18th century, which was the uh, dictionary of the English language by Dr. Samuel Johnson okay, in 1755. So, we shall stop here now and the last question of course, was um, uh, could be you could refer get a question on describe uh, or uh, you know enumerate some of the words um, and phrases which are um, current even today, okay, which are attributed to the great writer um, and uh, dramatist and poet William Shakespeare. So, you have a number of words here in uh, uh, these slides. Okay. For instance, um, salad days, the word, uh, then it is Greek to me, these are some of the phrases that we find in, uh, in Shakespeare's works and also we have words like, like dawn, dwindle, eyeball, picture, moonbeam, luggage, gossip, uh, Olympian, pedant, uh, radiance these are words that come from Shakespeare. Okay. So, this again is just a glimpse into the kind of um, issues that we had in during the early modern period okay. and we found the importance of Shakespeare and most Im more uh, you know most importantly really the printing press the coming in of the printing press and uh, the question of the vernaculars versus borrowing because the problematic question of foreign loan, loan words. Okay. These are some these are only some of the aspects and really if you have in one lecture you cannot uh, begin to even uh, touch upon there are so many other uh, areas, but uh, for a course like this uh, it is enough that you know some of the aspects and most importantly learn how to connect this is this has been my effort here. Okay. Learn how to connect the social, political and the economic to changes in language. This is very important. Learn also uh, that um, languages are highly politically charged. You know, every change um, are also uh, for instance there may be certain times where issues regarding even changes in language, even vocabulary, pronunciation, spelling may also be largely political questions, questions of nationalism, questions of allowing, not allowing, questions of the rise of a standard form of English, which today of course, is the biggest 
uh, uh, you know contentious issues the queen's english is only has today become perhaps it's it's quite safe to say only one variant of English because we have, as we saw in module one, so many Englishes. Okay, we no longer talk about world English. We talk about world world English itself is an oxymoron. Okay, world Englishes is as we saw in our lecture, one of the lectures in the first module. Okay, world Englishes is the, is, the, is the current term that we use. Okay, but you see what you know in this different. Um, uh, glimpses into the, the four different periods that we have used for the English language, how the language has changed okay, owing to socio-economic factors, owing to conquests you understand and finally, as you see in the next lecture uh, on modern English okay, owing to the growth of different industries, uh, particularly the information industry. Thank you so much.